I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome to the Q&A, everyone. Tom, what do we have in the way of questions this session? All right, we have we have some excellent questions. There are no bad questions. And so I want to thank everybody out there. Keep them coming in. They are questions at creekdevil.com. We love them. And they keep the topic alive. And they answer, if you have a question, there's probably hundreds of other people out there with the same question. So by all means, send them in. Um, I also want to say, if you like the show, tell the algorithm you like it. Click the like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you want to support the show, you can do so. There's a link to Patreon in the description. You can actually do it for as little as a dollar a month. And it really helps us out, keeps us going as well. All right. So the first question here is, have there been any updates from Dave Sheely down in the Everglades? Well, you know, I don't know. Um, we'll have to have, uh, we'll have to see if Brian uh, can contact him. I mean, with the hurricane going on down there right now, it's probably a, a bad time at the moment, but um, we'll see if we can find out what's going on with Dave. Yeah, Dave, if you're listening, uh, shoot us an email. Let us know you're okay. Uh, we do have some friends, quite a few of them down in Florida, and we want to make sure everybody's okay. Um, speaking of Florida, this next question is, where does the skunk ape go when a hurricane hits Florida? Well, you know, when, when Ian hit, I don't have a clue where it goes. Um, you know, I, I don't know I enough about just, Florida to be able to answer that. I think it suffers along with everybody else. Um. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure they've got places they can go to to kind of weather storms like that. Right. What, um, what do you think, Forrest? I mean. <clears throat> well, you know, it's amazing uh, how wildlife seem to sense these things. And uh, uh, barometric pressure has a lot to do with how, um, you know, animals, it affects our animals uh, and they, uh, react differently to it. I mean, we probably react to it too. We just don't realize it uh, as much as uh, we see behavioral changes in animals. And I think that they sense these things happening and they just, you know, of course I say they head for higher ground, but there's no such thing as higher ground in, in uh, Florida. Um, I think uh, Ocala is about one of the highest places there is around there. It kind of, it's kind of like the hill country of Texas, but uh, they're in Ocala, Florida. But, um, you know, I think they have enough good sense that something bad's getting ready to happen. Let's get out of here, you know. So, I mean, you see even pets and stuff that and stray animals that are on the streets that start moving for uh, safe places to get. So I think they would react the same way. I hope so. Um, this person also wants to know, is it safe to camp in a state forest if you're alone? And I'll just expand that to any forest. Is it safe? Um, you know, the Army has the same safety in numbers. Will, what are your thoughts? Yeah, definitely safety in numbers. I mean, that's always the rule of thumb. Um you know, I mean, lots of people go camping out in the forest without ever having any kind of incident. So and I think a lot of times that's, you know, there's lots of factors that can go into that. I mean, of course, on the creature side, it depends, you know, like we've talked, uh, I think, last time about, you know, dispositions and, you know, right down to how well they fed at a particular day, you know, what they're what they're going to do. Um, it may be in most cases they're not going to do anything where people are at. Uh, and if there are groups of people, you know, that's less like they're going to they're do anything there also. Uh, what are your thoughts, Forrest? 
Well, I personally wouldn't go camping by myself in the forest, but uh, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I'm a female. <clears throat> um, and I think I would probably be more vulnerable even uh, to human pred- uh, predation. So um, I just wouldn't feel comfortable doing that. Um, I know that there's plenty of people that talk about Sam Houston State Park and the big thicket area that even grown men down there won't go camping by themselves. And, I mean, the Bigfoot in that area just seem to be, I mean, they just seem to be a disagreeable sort. Um, You know, I don't know what it is about them, um, but they just don't seem to play nice. So I wouldn't wouldn't go down there and go camping by myself. And um, I think if I was to go, it'd probably be in a group of people. I'm just going to comment also here in Oregon, um, we have an extraordinarily large number of people that vanish, um, just poof, gone. And it's not human predation, as far as I can tell. It's not animal predation. Uh, they don't know what it is. It's just a lot of people who just disappear. And to the best of my knowledge, it's always one person, one person by themselves. So, and and I'll say this, the National Outdoor Leadership School recommends not for Bigfoot purposes, but just for general safety. Um, if you're hiking, hike in groups of four. And the reason behind that is if one person breaks a leg or an ankle or gets injured, one person can stay with the injured person and then two go for help instead of one. So just as a general safety guideline, uh, you may not be able to do it, but four is really the optimal number. Well, you know, they have a lot of disappearances out in East Texas, too. Kind of the same, same uh, scenario that you're speaking of. Just poof and they're right? gone. And some of them yeah. can do it while they're on the phone with the, the 911 dispatchers. You know, speaking of that, um, before we get into the question a little further, um, I should have mentioned in the beginning that we're doing a project. Uh, It's not book-related. It's not uh, for the podcast. But we're looking for um, information on missing people and if their families um, suspect, you know, that it may have been a Sasquatch responsible for their loved one's uh, disappearance, uh, please get a hold of us. And we'll explain to you what the project is when you talk to us. But... uh, We'd really, really appreciate hearing from folks out there. The best way to reach out to us is questions at creekdevil.com. In the subject line, just put in the word missing and put it in caps so it'll really catch our attention. Uh, But just missing in the subject line and then how you want us to contact you and and we'll take it from there. And and it's a project that will actually get um, some pretty good exposure, uh, you know, for the missing person. And, and hopefully, you know, maybe if, of course, you know, if it's not Bigfoot related, then, um, you know, maybe the person can be, um, you know, helped to be found by maybe somebody out there um, through the exposure we're going to be giving these situations. But if you think it's possible that a Sasquatch was responsible, We'd really like to to hear about that from you. So either way, uh, you know, we're trying to get exposure, you know, for these missing people out there. All right. Um, Okay, so we got another question here. Amy, Amy wants to know, during Will's first encounter when he was a teen, did he get the feeling the creatures wanted to do him harm? And was he afraid they'd follow him home? Well, it was, it was they were actually pretty close to my home. Um, I don't know, in feet, I don't know what how far it was from the house, maybe 200 feet. It wasn't very far. Um, I think I think had the circumstances been any different than they were, it's possible there could have been harm done to me by the creatures. I think the saving grace for me was the fact I was holding a rifle and I'd actually fired it in the air. Um, I I, kind of think 
I mean, I don't know. There was nothing really indicating either way that that had any effect on the situation. I just kind of feel like it did uh, because they did nothing and I was able to escape the situation. And just to clarify, you were a bit nervous at the time, right? Just a tad. <laughs> Is that an understatement? Just a tad bit. Yeah, it was, it was you know, <laughs> the proverbial underwear changing moment. Um uh, you know, so it was something that I, I would not want to repeat. How old were you, Will? I was 16. Oh, my. We we had seen, like, we'd, we'd found tracks two years before that, but, you know, we didn't see anything more. So, you know, when you're a teenager, things kind of go in one ear and out the other pretty quickly. If you don't sustain a situation, you know, you keep doing something and, uh, you know. When you're that age, you don't see anything more, and you move on to other things. Well, and kids, kids that age never think about uh, their mortality. I mean, they all consider themselves immortal. So, but you're you're the same age as a, a son-in-law of mine that was in a uh, a tree stand, and he saw one go by. I think y'all may have remembered me talking about that, and one uh, went uh, was about fifty yards away from him and went uh, through the woods. And he saw it, and uh, he never, he, he made his father actually, he waited till, uh his father came and got him and, and when it started getting dark. Nobody could figure out why he hadn't come in. So uh, his father actually came out there and got him. He stayed, so, he stayed in the tree guess, stand. He stayed in the tree stand, and I guess he'd have stayed there all night if nobody had come <laughs> get him, because he said he wasn't getting down. <laughs> so, you know, but he was 16, too. Well, I'm curious, in the timeline of you found the footprints, then you had the sighting in your, basically your backyard, um, you also had an encounter where the, um, I think the blackberry bushes were violently shaking. When, was that, that in was between later. those two? Oh, no, that was later. That was after. And I don't recall how long after that encounter. It was, it was sometime, it may have been up to a year later. Um you know, my friend John and I, we had that trail between his house and mine. And and it was, you know, it, it cut off a lot of time going from one house to the other, going up through the woods. But um, I, I went up the neighbor's driveway to where the trail began and and had that situation happen. And, and for me, that was just enough. I, I'd had enough. I wasn't going to go up there again. Uh you know, I, I'd walk the road before I'd go through that trail after that situation. And the situation was it just violently shook. Well, yeah, there was uh, independently all by itself. There was uh, there was a pasture to the left, and and there was a stand of trees to the right, and uh, along I guess about halfway up the driveway, they had kind of a long driveway, and and it was, sort of went up this slope. And about halfway up or so, there was uh, a bunch of blackberry bushes along the edge of the tree line. And as I walked up to it, I think I was, I think I was right next to it. And this, the whole bunch of bushes just shook violently. And there was a deep growl uh, from the other side. And I just kind of froze like, okay. And I turned around and went back the other way. And I mean, it was, it was, uh kind of the height of fear I, I don't even know why i mean it could have been anything but it was it was kind of a it was it was i say it was loud but it didn't have a lot of volume you know what i mean it was i don't even know how to describe that it was uh it was it was a strong how would you dis- it was a strong presence we'll put it that way how would you compare that to the growl that we you and i heard uh this this July, remember that road we went up? Yeah, it wasn't like that. It was, uh, this was just a very deep, kind of a, 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 it was, it was a very forceful growl, and it wasn't like a dog growl. It was, I, I don't even know how to describe it beyond that, but, uh, it was kind of a growl that made you want to turn around and say, okay, I'm not wanted in this spot. It's time to get out of here. <laughs> and I did. And, and you never went back and picked blackberries from that bush I never, at all, I never right? picked them up in that one anyway, but uh, it was just something you walked past, you know. And then not long after that, John 
use the trail to come to my house and he stayed kind of late and, and I let him take my my dog with him as for company and that's when he found the deer with its head twisted around and partially eaten up there and that was the last time he used the trail too <laughs> oh boy all right well kind of along that line of thinking we got a question from a gentleman named brian here brian says he wants to know bigfoot being an opportunist do you think that humans could or possibly have been a food food source with all the missing people in national parks that are never found it's not just national parks folks it's everywhere how realistic is it that a clan or clans have already discovered that humans are an abundant source of food well, I don't know it's something that they would do regularly, but we know they do, in fact, do this. And um, I guess I should mention that uh, we're getting set up to begin um, airing. What we're, what we're going to do with the Mr. Black interviews is we're going to break it up into pieces because it's it's pretty long, and we're going to be doing more of these lengthy recordings, so it'll be kind of an ongoing thing. Uh, and I, I don't remember if he talked about that. Uh, but we have actually a second Mr. Black we interviewed, and and he did speak specifically to that. Yeah. Boy, oh boy, those are both pretty nerve-wracking. Um, okay, this one is going to be more for Forrest, and this is from Robert. Uh, Robert wants to know, he says, one primate that I think think needs to be looked at is the lemur i agree i like lemurs um okay that is where there's giant lemurs they look like dogs and dog man could it be an offshoot of the lemur family they also make strange noises what are your thoughts uh comparing dog man to uh the lemur yeah, I think what he's looking at is, is there a possibility that um, there's a, the dog man is actually, um, I don't know, kind of a mutation of a lemur or somehow related to the lemur. And that is actually the primate that people are seeing as a dog man. In other words, could dog man have some lemur attributes? I think yeah. that's what he's asking. Okay, uh, let, let me let me take it from here, and I, I, I certainly appreciate where he's coming from. <clears throat> and this is strictly my opinion, of course, but uh, um, lemurs are very arboreal animals. Um, they're not given to uh, spending a whole lot of time on the ground. Um, they, um, they do have a lot of nasal prognathism, and I know that's what he's talking about. And... Um, uh, but they're they're really built for uh, being arboreal animals. Uh, now you do you do see a lot of these films where the the cute little lemurs are. They are cute little animals. My gosh, they are, and they do make cute pets too. Um, that they're running around on the ground with their long tails and such. And um, so, um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest something else. I appreciate where he's going with on the for the attributes of the lemur, but you got you do have that long tail to deal with. I'm going to go with something more along the lines of a baboon, because first off, they've got those huge jaws. You always you always hear when you talk about dog man that they um, have these huge canines, these huge jaws, massive jaws, and I refer everybody back to that uh, uh, Beast of Seven Shoots, and I didn't even know what that was. I had to actually go and look it up, and um, in fact, Chuck was the one that told me where to find it, and uh, and you really have to kind of, I, I see how the guy actually missed, the, and missed that in the picture, because you don't really see it. I mean, that's not the first thing that, that grabs your eye when you're looking at that picture. Um, but, um, uh, it, that thing almost looks like an upright baboon is what it looks like. Baboons will get up and walk bipedally. They have uh, the ability to do that. Now they don't do it for long periods of time, but they will, they can walk bipedally just like, uh, you know, great apes can. Um, 
and they've got that huge prognathism out there. And I don't know if you've ever seen them yawn and open their mouths. They have magnificent canines. And your mandrills do the same thing. Uh, the used to mandrills were all, all considered uh, to be part of uh, baboons uh, as well. They're now considered a, a different species. Uh, and mandrills, uh, 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 sidebar here, mandrills are the, the ones that have the beautiful coloration on their faces with the blue and red. Uh, Lion King, if you remember the one that was holding the, the, the lion cub up, that was a, uh, that was a mandrill. Um, and um, they're not as aggressive as the standard baboon. Baboons are just disagreeable sorts. Uh, I, you know, they have no problem trying to take on lions as a group and uh, leopards, uh, and uh, they are kind of nasty like chimpanzees. They will attack um, um, a lot of antelope and such and grab their fawns, and uh, they eat they eat quite a bit of meat. So I would see something like a dog man more progressing from something like a baboon and um they have all the attributes and and that's what i've always kind of said um that you know if there's a dog man out there i think it's probably something that's like a baboon and developed into you know that that that's something uh we talked about mr black doing further recordings um he's got a lot of t- a lot to talk about folks and a lot of it's bigfoot related but he is going to do two other pieces that really aren't bigfoot related just because it's part of the whole you know his experience uh one of those recordings is going to be about dogman and it's not what you think it is <laughs> uh and he's going to do a piece about ufo's because they they dealt quite a bit with that in the government too so uh, a couple of tidbits to look forward to besides the um, uh, the Bigfoot recordings that we've already done two hours and we're going to be doing some more with him. So anyway, something to look forward to, but I just wanted to mention that since the subject of Dogman came up. Tom, what well, else? You know what, I got to... S- oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Will. No, I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm done. Okay, I'm just going to say, and you know, I'm really... Um, I guess kind of honored that people are coming to us with these questions. You know, they have questions. Where do you go? You know, you want to get some answers. You want to go to a reputable source. And, of course, that's us. Just ask us. We'll tell you. (laughs) We do appreciate uh, it, though. We are. Yeah, we really do. And Kareem wants to know, and this is, again, going to the dogman thing. uh, Sometimes it occurs to me that Bigfoot may be wearing a wolf hide or a coyote hide over its head as in tricking people or just like that and maybe mix it with dog man other than some Bigfoots have pronounced snouts. Is it possible? And I got to say, I like this type of of out-of-the-box thinking. Um, So anyway, I'm going to throw it to the two of you to offer your thoughts and opinions on that. You know, and again, referring back to Mr. Black, some of the things that he's mentioned uh, do refer to that so and that's that's great that's a question we'll actually have to forward to him uh, because that's that's the next recording we're doing with him is it's listener questions uh, or any questions anybody has for him so if you have questions for mr black that you'd like answered now i i'm not sure he said the things that he he won't be able to answer would be things that would specifically uh, point to him to reveal his identity or it was something that maybe he wasn't exposed to because you have to remember folks uh even though that some of these people work specifically with these topics not everybody knew everything things were compartmentalized all right so thank you for those questions and uh again we're we're honored that you're asking us Okay, and here's one. Hello, recently I listened to episode 110, and there are several mentions of juveniles, and I think we're going to throw this one. We're going to start off with Forrest on this. Several mentions of juveniles seen climbing and swinging in trees. I was wondering if you've witnessed this behavior or have come across evidence of this behavior taking place. You're asking me? Um, (laughs) Well, I'm not, but this person is. (laughs) 
<laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I haven't seen any juvenile swinging in trees lately, but um, I, I, I think I would like to, but, uh, um, you know, and, and film that. Wouldn't that be lovely? Um, <clears throat> however, you know, the only thing that I can refer to is, and I think I, I think the last time we even had a QA, and a I, I, I brought, well, no, I think it was when Chuck was on, uh, we were talking about this because um, I had sent pictures to him and I had sent them to y'all of that cedar tree out there that was in the, uh, it used to be the old dog kennel for Cadney. And that tree is like bit, I mean, the, the cedars, the limbs are like twisted and pulled down and twisted and pulled down all the way around it. And they're flattened out on top. And now I don't think, you know, I, I, I've looked at that several times and, and I may be wrong. I can't see maybe a thousand pound animal, a full grown Bigfoot getting up there. Maybe they could. I'm certainly not going to climb up there and, and, and try it out. But it looks almost looks like something had been laying up there or sitting up there. And, you know, with all the different situations that I've had, and I just this just happened two nights ago uh, since <clears throat> I talked to you guys last somebody opened i came out in the morning and my cat house was wide open again all the cats were accounted for but the cat house was was open and i even got to thinking the cat food bowls were empty in there and i had big great big pans in there with cat food and feeders they were empty and i thought i just wonder if something is going in there and eating those well, raccoons, I got some pretty smart raccoons out here in Texas. And uh, we've got some crafty coyotes. But I don't know that any of them that can open those doors. Well, they're going to be very unhappy with me because now um, <laughs> all this time I've had this building and I didn't even realize it actually had a lock on it. And Jessica found the keys for me. So I'm going to keep it locked at night now. Um, because, you know, we'd had a couple of occurrences before where I'd come out there and I found I mean, the doors got open, the lights were coming on on the end of the trailer and all of these little uh, fun things. And I think I can see juveniles doing stuff like that because you know what? Um, they're just prime monkeys and apes at that teenage age, juveniles, sub-adults. They act just like teenagers, pubescent kids and the human uh development as well they all act the same you know let's see how much we can pick on the adults let's see how much little uh havoc and 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 chaos we can create it it all it all is the same too, mu I mean, too much energy age, to expend <laughs> yes they've, they've got way too much energy and 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 uh and way too much time on their little hands so uh yeah they're they're going to do it and and if i'm the the their victim they don't care you know uh, you know, I'm sure mom and dad probably are glad to be rid of them. You know, go mess, go mess with the old lady over there. You know, go harass her. Uh, you know, get out of our hair. Um, and you see this, <laughs> you know, you can see this in, in chimpanzee videos. And I mean, even the, the, uh, like you can actually see the, the adults like pushing them away, like go away, you know, leave us alone. You know, mom's wanting to take a nap and you got this kid that's lopping around and, and, and you, you can see the, that they're being antagonized by these uh, kids. So it, it all works the same. So, you know, but yeah, I would love to see some out here swinging in the trees and, and send y'all some wonderful videos, but uh, uh, so far that hadn't happened. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never seen juveniles either. I've only seen adults so far. Well, Tom, I think we're just about out of time for this segment. So any other questions we'll have for uh, the next segment this week? Yes, absolutely. Questions at creekdevil.com. And one final comment on what Forrest just said. Youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh. and folks, again, you know, if there's anybody out there that's got, you know, a missing family member and you suspect... You don't have to have proof, just your gut feeling that you think maybe a Sasquatch was responsible. Uh, we'd love to talk to you. And again, it's not for the podcast. It's not for books or anything like that. It's a different project. Um, and it will help get exposure for that person and maybe somebody out there 
uh, has information on your, your missing loved ones. So with that said, we're going to wrap this piece up and, um, I'm hoping we can start posting this Mr. Black interview information this weekend, Tom. I, I will talk about that, but I'd like to start posting that this week. Excellent. We're looking forward to it. All right, folks. Well, that'll do it for this session. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then... <laughs>